What's up y'all, it's Shuffle. Welcome to the Arbalest Guide. So when I talk about the Arbalest, I'm also talking about the Musketeer, except for like one key difference, which we will go over. Otherwise, treat them as the same character, treat them synonymously. Like in all the other guides that I've done so far, I will go over the strengths, weaknesses, the skills, how to build them, and then some team examples to get you started. With that said, let's get started with the strengths of the Arbalest. So the first thing of note about her is that her best attack sniper shot does have high base accuracy so usually you can not have to focus on getting accuracy for her because you can just give her damage which a lot of other damage dealers you have to give them accuracy first so that's kind of nice about her she's pretty easy to play so you just set her up and then she just knocks them down uh, she is a pretty tanky backline character so usually backline characters have less hp than normal but arbalest is pretty strong i think it's you know because she wears plate mail and stuff like that but otherwise, she is pretty strong and she has access to healing. Mark teams, which is where she does her best for damage. Mark teams are pretty good at killing either bigger enemies like mini bosses or some of the tankier double space enemies that appear, or they are really good at killing bosses. So this is not exclusive to Arbalest. So if you have a backline boss, Arbalest is pretty good at shooting them down. If you have a frontline boss, Bounty Hunter is good at chopping them down because they're both Mark characters, right? The next strength is that she is pretty or she has room for creativity because since you don't need to worry about the accuracy and stuff like that you can give her different trinkets to give her healing or support or more damage or utility and stuff like that so there's a lot of stuff you can do and then finally she is a dedicated range damage dealer there are not many characters who fill this role so there are not there are characters that can do well wherever you put them or like they have attacks that can reach the back lines of the enemies and stuff like that but the arbalest is someone that you can put in rank 4 or rank 3 which is the back of your party and they are reliably just pumping out damage each turn so that is pretty nice next we will talk about weaknesses for arbalest the first is that mark teams are kind of underwhelming and they are a little tough to build because there are a lot of ways you can go with them but when i say that they're underwhelming is that they excel in killing like mini bosses and bosses a lot of the time because those are the tougher enemies and Mark can put down a ton of damage very quickly. But if for some reason someone high rolls speed and you don't get the turns in the right order, or if you're facing an enemy that has multiple actions per turn, this is where Mark suffers the hardest. If they have multiple actions per turn, Marks fall off much quicker and you have to reapply them almost each turn instead of every three turns, which means that you're spending a lot of extra turns doing Mark instead of hitting Mark, which means you're losing a lot of effective damage. The next one is one of my biggest personal gripes with Arbalest, and that's the fact that her base damage is pretty low, especially at 7 to 14. She has a lot of ways to boost it, of course, with marks and trinkets and skills and all that, and she does have a lot of access to having extra damage, but having such low base damage means that if you can't get her a lot of setup or quirks and stuff like that, or if she can't camp, then her damage is pretty underwhelming, and considering she has the limitation on where she can shoot, it's pretty hard to get a lot out of her damage besides her shooting down like the first two or three people and then spending the rest of the fight healing you. The next weakness is that Arbalest likes to camp. This can also be a strength in a lot of ways because she does get a lot stronger if she gets to camp. But there are a lot of times that when you camp, you have to spend camp points to heal other people or put down buffs that you weren't expecting because something went wrong as you're getting to your camp spot. And sometimes you don't get to give Arbalest those points. And then also, if you're on a short mission, she doesn't do as well because she doesn't get to camp. So if you're not taking her on like medium and long missions or, you know, special missions also that have camping, then she doesn't see as much effectiveness as you would expect. The last weakness is one I bring up quite frequently, and that is the fact that since Musketeer is pretty much a reskinned Arbalest instead of an Arbalest skin itself, that means that you have to deal with Musketeer stuff like her... Like, the Musketeer herself showing up in the Stagecoach, and then Musketeer items showing up in loot pools, instead of being able to get other people's stuff. So you have to, like, deal with the double dipping between two characters that are essentially the same. And then the most important difference here is that the Musketeer has a much worse Farmstead Trinket. Not that it really matters, since that's something you purchase, but the fact that Arbless gets the way better Farmstead Trinket instead of Musketeer means Musketeer is just, like, categorically worse. Although she does look very cool. Now it's time to talk about skills. So obviously the Musketeer is the same as the Arbalest, they just have like different icons. So I'm just going to talk about the Arbalest here exclusively. 
With Sniper Shot, you get this massive bonus damage, and if you get the mark down, obviously, she just gets a ton of extra damage. So this doubles her effective damage, bringing it from 7 to 14 to 14 to 28, which is actually like leper level damage. So if you just spend someone else's turn to set her up, she actually hits that hard, which is pretty nice, and she also gets more crit than leper. Right here, also on this skill where it says the base crit mod is 9%, that means it always has 9% over her crit here, so this is 19. And then if they're marked, it gets another 13, so it goes up to 32. So just marking someone gives you like a 1 in 3 chance to crit, which makes this move pretty good. Obviously you can't hit rank 1, which is the front line, so that kind of sucks, but if you can keep setting this up, Arbless will put down some really good damage. So this is like your goal in each fight, is to get this up as much as possible. Suppressing Fire is an interesting move, because it's not as good in hallway fights, and that means that trying to find its other good applications is a little tougher. Because in hallway fights, you're just trying to kill backline enemies, and you're usually better off just marking them and shooting them than you are just trying to debilitate them. But there are some fights where either it's a boss or a mini boss, they just head to the back, and being able to hit them with this like two or three times so they just have basically like no accuracy is pretty awesome. It's also worth noting that if this sticks one time, most enemies in the game have like zero crit at that point, because a lot of the, the crit rates at like High Torch, especially on like Darkest, only go up to like, I don't know, like 12 to 17. So knocking off 19 is actually a pretty substantial amount. So Suppressing Fire is one of those things that if you can be creative enough and find a spot to use it, it actually does pretty well. But most of the time it just feels like it's not even worth putting on. I messed up that take, that's why Arbalest teleported to the character bar. But Sniper's Mark is a skill I have a lot of issues with. First of all, it's targeting is actually pretty bad. So other marks in the game, so like Houndmaster, Bounty Hunter, and Occultist specifically, they can use their dedicated mark from anywhere in the party to hit anyone on the enemy team. Arbalest can only use her sniper mark from these two spots to hit these spots on the enemy team, if you're looking at it from their direction. And that is really bad. Not only that, it's got a dodge debuff penalty, which Arbalest doesn't have difficulties hitting things just because she gets a lot of uh, base accuracy and bonus accuracy so this mark isn't good for her and since she can hit the frontline person with it it's not good for bounty hunter or anyone else that she's trying to help as well so this mark is pretty bad and there are a lot of times you don't use it but like if you want to do double arbalest or something then go ahead but in most cases it's usually better to just take a cultist and have him if you want the dodge mark because he also has access to Weakening Curse, which covers like every type of enemy in the game between two skills. So this move isn't that good. I almost never take it. Bola isn't too bad, like on paper, because you go, well, Arbalest can't hit rank 1, so this gives her something to hit rank 1. But then you have to remember, she loses her mark synergy, so that's already half her like ideal damage. So she's back down to 7 to 14. And then it's half of that 7 to 14. So it's like, I think that comes out to 4 to... 4 to something, like 4 to 8 on damage, which is really bad. And then having this knockback effect is pretty awkward because the frontline enemies usually have higher knockback resist, or I should say movement resist, so it's harder to knock them back. And then also the fact that this can knock one person instead of both of them. Sometimes you just like move the two, like you move the first person to rank 2 and rank 2 doesn't move, so they go up to rank 1. And then you're not really getting too much effective value out of it. So this move just isn't that good. Like, it's good to help chip in and finish something off, but honestly, Blind Fire might just be better if there's only one enemy left. Speaking of Blind Fire, this is what Arbalest does if she gets stuck up front and has to do something. So she loses 10% damage. I don't quite understand why. I mean, I guess because it is a blind shot. But her damage is already pretty low, and again, she loses Mark Synergy. So anytime she's not using Sniper Shot, her damage not only gets, like, super bad, but even if... She's using one of these other skills where her damage gets cut further. It is actually horrible. So Blind Fire, its best application is like Arbless gets stuck up in the front and then she hits Blind Fire to give herself speed to move next turn. The other way to use this is if you want to do some support stuff with Arbless, then you just hit Blind Fire so she has speed for a couple turns and then she gets like faster bandages and stuff like that. So there are some creative ways to use this, but again, this is kind of like... If you're not using Sniper Shot, then the rest of her damage tools aren't that good. Battlefield Bandage is a great reason to take Arbalest. The on heal effect of 4 to 5, obviously this can be boosted. 
It's not that strong. It's an okay heal. It will get someone off Death's Door. Usually it will get them out of range of a bleed or blight. Unless you're at like end game, then sometimes they tick for four, so that does suck. But the chance, or not chance, but the bonus healing effect is actually what makes this super good. So healing received and like bonus healing and all that, that caps out at 100%. So you can never do more than double your healing to someone. But with that said, being able to get this on someone like two times, you don't really need to bring healing trinkets at that point. And then there's stuff you can do like using battlefield bandage at the end of the fight, the fight ends, you can eat food and get the extra healing received. So this does have some pretty good use. And I think this thing should be on like every Arbalest build just because having extra healers isn't bad. And at the end of the fight when there's like one person up at rank 1 that Arbalest can't shoot, she can spend the rest of the fight just healing. So that's actually an okay thing for her to do. Rallying Flare is actually a pretty good move in a lot of cases. The thing that is weird about it is it's designed to get rid of stealth and that's like the worst thing about it. The reason it's bad is because since it's an attack that has to hit the enemy, if the enemy dodges the flare attack, they stay in stealth. The other reason it's bad is that most enemies that have stealth are faster or as fast as Arbalest, so they usually get one turn off on their two turn stealth, and then next turn you've flared them, but it's like they usually go at the start of the round or very close to the start of the round, and your other damage dealers have already attacked. So this flare getting rid of stealth is one of the worst things it's for. Unless some enemy can stealth in the middle of battle, like the, the horse in the farmstead, that's like the only other time it's okay, but why are you taking Arbalest to Farmstead? So that means that the bonus torch is okay, and then the clear stun and mark actually helps quite a bit because since Arbalest is so slow, your other characters have likely gone already, so if they're stunned and she's going at the end of the turn, she's clearing the stun for next turn, which is pretty helpful. And then the mark synergy, or I should say getting rid of mark synergy from the enemy side, prevents a lot of damage because there is a surprising amount of mark synergy among enemy uh, ranks, sorry, I should say just enemy groups. In the wield specifically, this helps quite a bit. In the warrens, there's some mark synergy. I think the generic uh, cultist guys that hit you with their wolverine claws, I think they have mark synergy. So there are a lot of chances to reduce mark synergy, or if you have like withstand on your leper or bulwark of faith on your uh, crusader and they mark themselves, this gets rid of it. There are reasons to do that. And then it uh, reduces stress on top of it, which I wish the chance was higher. I wish this was like just guaranteed minus three stress to everyone, or even minus two stress to everyone guaranteed, that'd be a lot better. But as it is, the 67% chance is pretty crappy. But I do think Rallying Flare is usually worth taking on most Arbalest builds, just because there is a lot of utility in it. And there are some fights in the game that it just completely ruins, like, for the enemy, if you just get to cleanse all this crap. Now we're going to talk about some camp skills. Field dressing is interesting, just because I wish the first heal, the 35%, I wish that was guaranteed, but it's not, which means that you can actually miss the roll on both of these and heal for zero, which is pretty bad. Likewise, you can hit both the rolls on these and heal for 85. So there's some variants that we didn't want, but it always removes bleeding, but it's like, if you need to get rid of bleeding, why not just use wound care? Marching plan is definitely one of her two best camping skills. So you're probably like, why do I want to give everyone else two speed, right? Because it says all companions, not parties. So that's an important distinction. Arbalest does not get the two speed off this. But giving the rest of your team two speed means that you can probably sacrifice speed trinkets in base so you can stack damage and utility. But also it helps if you have a mark party because it lets all of the other people have a much better chance of going first to set up Arbalest. With that in mind though, the bonus speed is also helpful just because speed is a very important stat. So if three out of four of your people are going consistently ahead in the round, you can actually, or I should say in battles, you can actually press some pretty good advantages. So this is worth using, even though it has some similarity to the next thing we're going to talk about. Restring Crossbow. Welcome to ADC Arbless for you mobile players. But Restring Crossbow is pretty cheap at three, which is nice. It gives her accuracy, which is helpful but not you know completely necessary but then it gives her 20 percent damage and eight percent crit which is incredible and then you lose two speed on top of it you're probably like why do i need her to lose two speed well that's because she has to be set up she wants someone to mark for her and weakening her own speed down to three you know at max rank makes it so your houndmaster or bounty hunter or occultist consistently get to go before her and she doesn't have to worry about outspeeding them and then having some awkward turns so they go before her, they set her up like every single time, and then she does a lot of extra damage because of it. 
This is definitely one of the buttons you hit. If Arbalest is your boss killer, like if you understand the fight that you're going into, and you go, I need backline damage, I'm setting up Arbalest, this is the button you press, because she will pay for it. I should say, pay out for it, not pay for it. That makes it sound like a consequence, when it is a consequence for the enemy. Triage is a pretty interesting skill. Its best use is if you obviously have everyone just hurt. Again, this doesn't heal Arbalest, but it is pretty nice to heal 60% HP across your total party. So there are parties that don't take Vestal as a group healer, so sometimes you have Occultus as a, a healer, which I recommend against that, but you know, you might have it. Or you have Crusader solo healing, which is possible. Flagellant's actually a pretty good healer if you want to set him up for it. So this just gives you access to group heal, which is pretty hard to find in this game outside of Vestal. So triage is actually pretty useful. Arbalest gets some pretty cookie cutter quirk choices like Unerring and Eagle Eye, but there are some fun ones you can do, like Hot to Trot. So Hot to Trot is bonus damage and crit on turn 1. Every single fight in the game sees turn 1, and if you can set up Arbalest and give her just a bit more extra damage and get her crit buff rolling, that is pretty nice. Next, no surprise, Unerring flat range damage. She appreciates that. And then in the topic of crits, Eagle Eye is obviously really good. But then I would also argue that Deadly makes it or makes a good addition as well. Because between Eagle Eye and Deadly, that's an extra 7% crit chance on top of everything she already has. And getting more crit on her gets her more uptime on her crit buff, which is bonus damage against marked enemies. So there are some pretty good damage gains to be had if you can itemize and quirk correctly that may not be readily apparent. Hippocratic is actually an interesting one for a support arbalest. I'm still doing some testing with it, but I do like it so far because having any access to extra healing is a welcomed impact. By having arbalest with some solid healing output on her own, this opens up your team to using something like Vestal in rank 2 because then you just worried about the group heal, or Occultus as a healer, which isn't usually recommended, but it's okay with Arbalest, and then you get Mark Synergy, or Antiquarian if you have to use healing, for instance. There are just a lot of other things that you're allowed to do if you have a reliable healer, and getting Hippocratic on Arbalest does help in that regard. Finally, for quirks, we should just talk about the standard defensive quirks that we're all used to at this point, so Unyielding resists like Bleed and Blight, or Tough, Hard Skin, Steady, any of those are pretty good on her, just because they're in general good on pretty much anyone. One final, final note here that came from Thick Veiny Sausage, who is one of my favorite people. But Arbalest is actually pretty good with rabies, and that is because she has high base accuracy normally. So she can actually take the penalty from rabies, and she greatly appreciates the extra damage. So if you need to supplement her accuracy just a little bit more, maybe with the Prophet's Eye or the Ancestor Pistol or something like that, then giving her rabies or something else that kind of hurts her accuracy is actually worth doing. So if you're going to run diseases on your Arbalest, make sure that your Sanitarium does not have the upgrade in the Medical Ward that removes extra diseases because then you can get rid of syphilis and then accidentally get rid of your rabies at the same time, which is not ideal. Marked for Death is the first team we're going to talk about here. And you can play it in a different way too. You could put Occultist in rank 2 instead of rank 3. So you move him up a spot and then you give him Hands from the Abyss. That's actually a pretty cool way to do it. Because Occultist is a better stun bot than uh, Houndmaster, but he can do it. But that's just one example. You can also put a Vestal instead of Occultist, then it loses the name. But you get more consistent healing and stuff. But uh, Let's start with Arbalest here. So this team is like an example of a quintessential... Mega Mark Synergy, where pretty much everyone can either do it or benefit from it, except Occultus. And Arbalest is going to start us off with the Sniper Shot, so no surprise here, just a ton of damage. You want to mark with one of these two first, and then have her shoot them, and then you get the most value. Blind Fire is your skill that can hit rank 1 while doing the most damage, instead of losing, you know, half of it to Bola. So this is okay, you won't be pressing it much, but it is there, especially if she gets trapped up in the front by like a pole or something. The bandage, no explanation here, I guess, except for it's really good, and as we were saying before, Occultist kind of struggles as a solo healer, like you can do it, but it's not that reliable, so having other heals on the team will help him out quite a bit, and you're going to see examples of that, so Battlefield Bandage, kind of a no-brainer. And then Flare rounds out the cast here in terms of skills. Just a lot of utility. The extra torch saves you some money here and there. Because it's 
pretty much like one hallway panel every time you shoot it. And then being able to prevent damage from being marked and stuff like that is pretty helpful. The stress relief isn't as big of a deal, but it is there. For trinkets, we are going to give Arbalest the Wolf's Tassel. This is no surprise that it is one of the best marked trinkets in the game, if not the best. So our Hyper Carry Arbalest will enjoy having it. The bonus crit for size 2 or bigger does apply to any enemy that is also larger than size 2. There are a couple bosses that this does apply to, so don't get confused. Like, does this apply if they're 3 and 4 space? Yes, it does. This could go on Bounty Hunter 2 if you wanted, but since Arbalest is our damage dealer and we're setting her up to be that, then it makes sense that she gets it instead of Bounty Hunter or Houndmaster in this case. Keening Bolts, this is just an example of a high level trinket that you can use. The Tassel is pretty high level too, but there are other ways to get damage besides this. But I'm just trying to show you like the most damage potential that you can put on this character. So if we have Quirks that give us bonus damage, then it obviously gets higher. But just between our two trinkets and Sniper Shot, if they are marked, we are getting... Was it 7 crit plus the 22 from this? So that's an extra 29 right there. So we're up to 39% yeah, 39 chance to crit plus 100% bonus damage plus another 40 plus, or yeah, plus 40 between these two trinkets, which is quite a lot. And if they happen to be a large enemy, then we're up to, uh, what is that, 44% crit as well. And this is before we factor in camp skills or quirks. So if we have... 44, I think that's the number we're doing right here. If we have 44 from that, we get up to 52 with Restring Crossbow. And then if we have Deadly and Eagle Eye, that is 59% chance to crit on Sniper Shot. That's pretty hot. Occultist is pretty flexible with his skills. I like the core of these three to cover most bases, but then like your fourth doesn't have to be Sacrificial Stab. It could be something else like the Artillery, or it could be the Pole. Or if he's in rank 2, it can be the Hands from the Abyss. You have a lot of options here. But I do think that the heal is pretty universal to like every occultist build just because it is helpful to have it. The occultist mark is also another thing that's helpful. So on a team like this, you want as many people able to mark and then hit marks as possible. So occultist frees up Bounty Hunter and Houndmaster to do damage on their turns if he happens to go first. So that's actually pretty nice to have. Weakening Curse. This is a really interesting move because it is proactive damage reduction. So this team doesn't have too much in the way of stuns. Like, it does have stuns, but it doesn't have something gnarly like, you know, blinding gas that's awesome. So we have to really pick and choose who we're stunning and when. And we also don't have backline stuns, so that does kind of suck. So Weakening Curse does help reduce damage coming into us, especially if the enemy is like an unclean giant, which you can't just burst down even with Mark, unless you get like three crits back to back. But even then, on Blood Moon, you might not be able to do it. So being able to reduce their incoming damage is translating to effective healing, and then having a third way to get rid of protection on enemies is also helpful. For trinkets, you're actually pretty flexible on Occultus, but I just gave him Ancestor Scroll to help his uh, healing out. So if he does roll like a 10, it goes up to 13 because of how rounding works, which is pretty nice. So not too much here. This could be anything else like utility or healing, right? But the Overture box, I usually like this to be Something defensive, just because Occultist does have really bad defenses. And if we're not running guard on Houndmaster, then he does need some way to not get smashed as easily. And giving him some dodge and then some extra HP on top of it does cover a lot of bases, so I do think this is pretty nice. Otherwise, this could be like the Flesh's Heart, this could be Heavy Boots, there are a lot of options here. I'd kind of recommend against Heavy Boots because you do want to keep his speed up. But any source of like extra speed and dodge does help Occultus quite a bit. You can also get resists. So Cleansing Crystal, all those things, there's a lot of options here. So just as long as you're giving Occultus some form of defense, that is usually the best thing for him. Now that we're on the third character, I'm realizing like how flexible this team is. So Houndmaster has some pretty cool choices you can make. So with this loadout, I went with the Hound's Rush to get the most damage out of single target because that's kind of what this team is going for. Target Whistle is the best mark in the game. It's pretty much non-negotiable. Well, I shouldn't say it's non-negotiable. You can certainly debate it if you want, but Target Whistle is just really effective, specifically because it is the highest amount of protection reduction in 30%, and it's got a naturally higher chance to uh, land at 170, whereas, for instance, the Bounty Hunter has 140, even though he does get bonus speed. So that said, 
We have Lick Wounds because, again, helping Occultus heal is always nice to have. And then Blackjack is a pretty good stun, so that's why you put on the Cudgel, even though we do lose speed. So you can spend your first turn setting up Arbalest, who shoots and kills something, and then you can stun a bunch of people with Houndmaster and Bounty Hunter. And then Arbalest can comfortably shoot, like, the person on, or in rank 3 or 4 the next turn, and then you can clean up after that. So having stuns that are strong, like these, uh, all three of these characters have access to, is pretty nice. So you should be taking at least two of them. Realistically, you do have a lot of options for Houndmaster, so if you don't want to take Lick Wounds, for example, you can take the Guard. Guard is a mechanic that does very well with the Cultist because he has a strong single target heal. So forcing damage onto specific people lets Occultus have better targets for healing, so that's pretty nice. You don't get access to Cry Havoc unless you swap Occultus and Houndmaster, but it is there if you want to use something like that. And then Hound's Harry, this team doesn't do as well cleaving enemies down because it doesn't have as much control and it doesn't have as much durability as other teams. But you can still use Hound's Harry if you really want to, and in that case you can run even the Houndmaster set so he uh, gets even more bonus damage by doing this. And you can even enable the Crimson Court set with Caltrops or something if you want it to go that way as well. So there's just a lot of options in this team. It's just a matter of like what you're looking for and what you're going up against. For Trinkets, I do like the evidence of corruption for a couple different reasons. Obviously, scouting is super important just at any point in the game, just because you prevent surprises when you scout fights. You can also find secret rooms on longer missions, which is pretty cool. But the minus surprise chance is also very important, because Arbalest is someone who, like Leper, if she gets knocked out of position, it really hurts, and she starts to struggle. So if he gets surprised on turn one, you don't get to set up your awesome mark-and-shoot strategy, your hot-to-trot goes to waste. And a team that already doesn't have a lot in the way of durability, that likes to go first and set up and stun things, suddenly is just out of position and just getting hit in the face by four enemies. So reducing that occurrence as much as possible is usually the way to go. Of course, this could be any support trinket, this could be Ancestor's Map, this could be Survival Guide, this could be Seer's Stone. There are a lot of options here, but obviously Evidence of Corruption is definitely one of the best. Again, our trinket choices are flexible, so I like the Cudgel Weight if I'm going Blackjack, just because the 175 stun chance makes it very reliable, and even enemies that have like 90 stun resist, which is what you start seeing later on in the game when you start getting access to the tougher enemies, so 90 stun resist becomes quite common. So having up to 175, which is an 85% chance to stun at that point, is really nice, and it lets Houndmaster control the front line while Arbalest starts to shoot down the back. And then by the time Arbalest is through the back line, which is usually two or three turns, then you have the front two and you can keep rotating stuns and kill them slowly like that. So even though Houndmaster is pretty good at direct damage or bleeds and stuff like that, he has some really good utility as well if you decide to use it. Alright, so we keep talking about flexibility in this team, and Bounty Hunter is another person with a lot of flexibility in the moveset. Bounty Hunter's main job, though, is to use Collect Bounty besides using Mark for Death. Which, actually, isn't that what the team is named? Hold up. It is. It's named after Bounty Hunter. But yeah. So, the reason we want Collect Bounty is because this team kind of struggles with killing Rank 1 specifically because Arbalest can't shoot that, except with like blind fire in this case. So having Collect Bounty to close out fights is actually the most helpful thing you can do with Bounty Hunter. Again, we want to be able to set up marks as soon as possible. So either Bounty Hunter or Houndmaster goes first, and whoever goes first is the one marking. So either one, if it sticks, it's ideal. It doesn't really matter too much, even if the difference in protection is like 10%. Plus it has the added benefit that if Bounty Hunter does mark first, he gets his speed bonus for like, you know, the next couple turns and he gets to uppercut and turbo mark and stuff like that, so that's pretty cool. For control tools, we are stuck with uppercut. I had, I think I had flashbang like locked in by accident because I forgot that you can't use it in rank 1 anymore. So I did have it initially, but we're stuck with uppercut, but uppercut is pretty good. It disrupts stuff and it does have a pretty good stun chance. So this is what we're doing alongside blackjack after we have stuff marked and arbalest is shooting. And if you get to knock stuff, from like rank 2 to 4, usually they don't get to use any good moves. You know, most monsters can't do that. So that is an added benefit, which is pretty nice. Your fourth move can either be Come Hither, or Caltrops, or Finish Him. I actually like Finish Him the absolute least, 
just because we're depending on Arbalest to shoot rank 4 and 3. But there are times where, even if they're marked, the enemy might have like 35 hit points and Arbalest hits them for 30. So you have to clean it up. So finish him is pretty good in that regard. So I guess it makes sense as the fourth uh, item. Uh, skill. I couldn't remember the word. Words are hard. But like I said, you can use Come Hither to some effect. It's good for the same reason that Uppercut's good, where it disrupts them and pulls them out of position. And then Caltrops is actually really awesome, but the only time I would use Caltrops is against a boss. So if I know I'm killing a boss, then I would actually swap maybe Uppercut if it's a backline boss, and then put on Caltrops. Just because even if you don't stick the bleed, the debuff of lowering their speed and increasing damage taken is actually pretty awesome. So if you want to put like debuff chance on Bounty Hunter instead of stun chance if you're going boss hunting, then it actually makes it a much better move than finish him in those circumstances. For Trinkets, I like the Hunter's Talon just because this is a lot of effective damage. Bounty Hunter has okay accuracy, but he likes to have just a bit more and this puts him there. And then you also get the 6% crit, so more crits means more stuns are sticking, more debuffs are sticking, more uh, damage from your attacks, so there's a lot of cool stuff here. The other trinket, I have Stun Amulet in here just because having bonus stun chance on Uppercut is pretty nice. And there are some frontline stunners, which means if Bounty Hunter cannot get stunned by like the Skeleton or Tidal Slam and stuff like that, then it's a lot better for him. Otherwise, this can be something defensive like Flesh Heart or Cleansing Crystal if you're not going to use Caltrops. You just have a lot of access here. So you can do Utility as well. You can do Ancestor's Map or Survival Guide, Seer Stone. You can do Dazzling Charm if you don't have Stun Amulet. There's just so many things. You have so many options here. So like I keep saying, this team has a lot of flexibility. This team is pretty straightforward. You want either Houndmaster or Bounty Hunter to go first. One of them sets the mark. And for example, let's say Bounty Hunter goes first and he marks. Then if Houndmaster goes right after, it's usually better for Houndmaster to stun just to prevent things like guards or just any damage coming in or whatever those effects may be. It's usually better to stun on the opening turns because there are more enemies alive. And then Arbalest cleans up the first kill ideally with a pretty high just flat damage hit or even a, uh, a crit. You know, you have a pretty good chance of critting at that point. Then you rinse and repeat on turn two, stun the other frontliner, mark the other backliner, shoot the other backliner. Occultist is helping out with marks because he can open up with a mark as well if it's like the start of the turn and no one needs a heal at that point. So occultists can actually do that as well and then once the back line's gone because the back line is more threatening to this team because stress healing is very hard to get then you switch arbalest to healer for like turns three four five ideally because the back line's gone at that point so arbalest is throwing out heals to recover everyone or the occasional rallying flare to try and work off some stress and Occultist is also dumping some heals or maybe some weakening curse to reduce damage incoming. And then you're relying on Bounty Hunter and Houndmaster to clean up the front couple people. So it's pretty straightforward. It won't take too much practice. It's just literally mark person, shoot person from like literally the back to the front. So rank four, three, two, one. Obviously the strategy changes a little bit if you're fighting a boss, especially if you know the boss. But you know, if you don't know what the boss is, then you probably won't be taking this team because you won't know what boss is in the back. Long story short, it's a one-two punch. Mark something, shoot something, stun something. I guess that's a three, a three punch or whatever. So mark, shoot, stun, mark, shoot, stun, mark, shoot, stun, all the way through the entire battle. This next team sets up Arbalest to be a support and damage like hybrid type deal. So we give her a pretty conventional move set, but then we split her trinkets up to cover both roles. And when we put Vestal in rank 2 on this team to give something, or to have a team that's a little more fun to use and not the, the normal stuff that we've been seeing, especially like the last team is pretty cookie cutter, just mark and shoot stuff, this team is actually pretty fun. So having Arbalest be able to cover single target heals, which her single target heal is actually okay, and Vestal gets to use group heal, then you have some actual like good healing output on this team, which makes it a lot safer than it looks at first glance. And then we have like two people that can stun. Actually, we have three people, but two of them are going to be stunning pretty consistently. Starting off, no surprise, we have Sniper Shot. This is pretty self-explanatory. Bounty Hunter will find turns to mark rank three or four, and then Arbalest shoots them. 
Blind Fire is to let Arbalest hit rank 1, and sometimes you do want the bonus speed because you want to get earlier heals or an early flare or something like that. It does have uses, and I do like it a bit better than Bola because we have other units that have some pretty good single target damage here, so we can burn down stuff pretty quickly. Obviously, Blind Fire is not reliable, but once you get down to the first rank person and Arbalest can't reliably shoot them, and she doesn't need to heal, then you can actually just shoot out a Blind Fire if you don't want a Rallying Flare. Bandage is a no-brainer. Like I said, we lose Vestal's pretty good single target heal, and we trade it for Bandage, which is also a pretty good single target heal, especially if you have to keep dumping heals into the same person because it gets stronger every time you use it. Then we have Flare just to disrupt any of the enemy tactics. So sometimes Arbalest can actually knock something out of stealth and it's worthwhile. Otherwise, being able to clear stuns, because there are quite a few in the game, that come from tougher enemies, so being able to clear those and clearing Mark Synergy is never bad. If we get the stress relief on top of it, that's just a bonus. Our first trinket is going to be Medic Screeves just to make our single target heal just a little bit better, so that's pretty cool. This way we don't have to worry about stacking the buff too high before it starts to become an effective single target heal, so by having this on uh, at the start, then we come out of the box healing like 6 to 8, I believe, and that's actually pretty nice. Our second trinket is just any source of damage. I put Legendary Bracer just to show some options. Otherwise, this could be Keening Bolts or Musket Ball or uh, just anything that gives you a good chunk of damage, but you also want to try and avoid giving Arbalest a speed up because you don't want her to go before Bounty Hunter because you want Bounty Hunter to be able to go first and then mark for her. Bounty Hunter is pretty important to this team, even though he only gets four skills and two trinkets. There's a lot for him to do each turn, so he probably has the... The most impactful turns, and you probably spend the most time thinking about them, just because like when he goes in the round and what he's doing is actually very important. So we're giving him the responsibility of stunning and marking and then cleaning up kills. So you do have some flexibility in terms of trinket choice, but I think the skills here are actually pretty solid. Again, collect bounty, unsurprising. It's just there to clean up kills because sometimes you have a marked person in rank 2, or like you have a corpse go down so they fly up front and then Bounty Hunter can just finish them off. So he does clean up kills pretty well in this regard. We're using Marked for Death because reducing protection is awesome. You don't even have to have Mark Synergy for this to be good. This helps Vestal, this helps Helene because they are doing direct damage. So being able to take some protection off the enemy is pretty nice. We're using Flashbang because Bounty Hunter is not in rank 2 so he can't uppercut. So Flashbang is our stun of choice. And Flashbang is a pretty good stun and if it gets a pretty good movement effect on whoever gets stunned. Sometimes it can mess up one or two of the other enemies, which is pretty nice, so it's pretty solid. Good accuracy, good stun chance, nothing too crazy going on besides pure efficiency. Finish him is mostly here for the reach, so this could be Caltrops or Come Hither if you find a reason to use them, but mostly this is to help Arbalest clean up rank 3 kills if she doesn't, for some reason, you know, get them on her own, so you get like a mark Arbalest hits for like 25, and then we have to clean it up with finish him the next turn. That kind of sucks when it happens, but it does happen, so being able to use this and leave Hellion open to double stun or use if it bleeds somewhere else is pretty nice, so I think finish him is a good force skill. Your trinkets are pretty flexible for Bounty Hunter here, but I think we used this in the last team. I'm going to put on Hunter's Talon just because it is a pretty good crits and accuracy trinket and bounty hunter does find plenty of turns to do damage so this helps him quite a bit in that regard and your second trinket can be pretty much whatever you want this could be like the camping helmet this could be even an ancestor's map this could be flesh heart if you want him to be a little more defensive so you have some options here especially because flashbang has a really good baseline stun chance but just to make sure that flashbang does stick i do like to give bounty hunter some form of stun chance vestal She's actually pretty fun to use in this team. So this is, in fact, the meme Bonk Vestal, which is just the name for, like, Rank 2 Vestal because they consider Mace Bash the Bonk. But this is actually effective, surprisingly. Even if you're not against Unholy, there are quite a few ways to boost Vestal's damage, which makes this pretty viable. Mace Bash is our attack of choice. Vestal suffers as a damage dealer because other damage dealers can usually get pretty high crit rates, usually over 30, and that is very hard for Vestal to do, which is probably one of the best reasons to say that she's not a great damage dealer, but she can get some pretty good just like flat damage increases that kind of make up for it. So Mace Bash 
We don't really care about the unholy bonus because the ruins is only one area, so this can actually still do okay in like the warrens or the wield, which is why we need to reduce protection on enemies. But otherwise, we're just trying to stack as much damage as possible and then hit them with Mace Bash. Dazzling Light is here to be helpful because it is better than the dodge debuff skill that she has at the end of her bar. I can't remember what it's called. But you usually won't be pressing this because we have other ways to be stunning. So it's just here's insurance. It is nice to have. And I think it's just better than the other moves. So that's why we have it on. The best thing about Vestal is Divine Comfort. So this is why she eclipses all other healers in this game. It's not just her consistency. It's just the fact that she can heal another person at the same time, which is pretty awesome. And the fact that she can use Divine Comfort from rank 2 actually is a saving grace for Melee Vessel because otherwise it would probably be close to unplayable. Like, you could still use it and do stuff, but sacrificing Divine Comfort is usually pretty hard to justify for a lot of teams. So being able to do something else with her and then have, you know, three other people and still give her access to this is actually pretty cool. Hand of Light, though. It is a range attack, which kind of sucks because this doesn't get synergy with our melee boosting abilities. But you want to use this on turn 1 just to give Vestal the extra 10 accuracy and 35% damage. She will get this buff even if she misses, so don't worry about that. Because otherwise, you have to put an accuracy trinket on her, which is a little tough to fight for stats at that point. So you can actually just stack a bunch of damage on her and then use this. Personally, I only press Hand of Light one time and then I start doing my other... Vestal stuff because if you press it more than once you're really putting a lot of pressure on Vestal to do damage like next turn and sometimes you hit this twice and then there's like a cleave attack or something that comes in or someone just gets hit a couple times or like they spread out their damage across the whole party and then you have to spend a turn healing which means you're not spending a turn doing damage so you lost some pretty good value on this so I only recommend hitting this once but there are plenty of situations where you can probably hit this more than once and be okay. Profane Scroll is the reason, or I should say the other reason besides Divine Comfort that you can run Rank 2 Vestal. This just gives her a bunch of stuff that she wants and makes her pretty good up there because Vestal does have some strong HP and then she gets some protection with this, which is nice. So she just gets a flat increase of damage, some protection, and then 33% healing on Divine Comfort, which is awesome. And then she gets plus 15 stress, which is manageable because stress usually hits backliners more than frontliners but it is relevant so just be aware the plus stress does suck with atonement beads just because if we do afflict we're probably not going virtuous it's a very low chance at that point but being able to use the scroll and atonement beads together gives vestal an extra 30 percent flat damage so that's what i was saying before she doesn't have strong crit rates but you can get her flat damage up pretty high so we have these two together that's 30 extra damage on mace bash and then we also have this, so that's an extra 65% damage on Mace Bash, and that's actually usable. So even without, or I should say with this tooltip here, she's already up to 9 to 17, and she gets much higher. She can get close to uh, Leopard damage, which is pretty nice. So with Atonement Beads, you get some crit and melee damage, which is awesome. You could also use the set together, because Salacious Diary does make this pretty nice. And then you get bonus uh, stun chance, but then you're kind of forced into Illumination, which I don't like. Otherwise... Having the extra stun chance makes her Dazzling Light pretty useful. But like I said, I usually don't find myself hitting Dazzling Light, so I don't think that the Crimson Court set is actually super needed. This kind of goes without saying as well, if you can build a dedicated melee Vessel, that's usually a little bit better than just having one that has like a healing loadout. But, you know, any Vestal can still run this. It's just, you lose a little bit of effectiveness. I feel like I don't talk about Hellion enough in my videos, and I don't make enough teams with her for people to try, but she's usually pretty good in a lot of teams. So in this case, she's going to use the first four skills, which I think is her just best overall loadout. And we're going to start with Wicked Hack, which is just hit stuff. It's very effective. Iron Swan is like Wicked Hack, but, you know, plus one crit, and it just hits the back line. This is actually very important, because Hellion hits so hard, and backline enemies, especially like rank 4, those usually have the lowest amount of HP that you're bringing Hellion just massive damage stat to rank 4, and she can help kill those things pretty quickly. And sometimes you can just get like an opening crit and kill whatever's back there. It's pretty nice. Our third skill is Barbaric Yop, and having access to a double stun is very awesome for Hellion. Even though she does get a little penalty, which sucks, being able to control front lines 
and reduce incoming damage is super important and you're not putting as much strain on Vestal and Arbalest to be putting out healing. Instead you can just reduce incoming damage because we do have basically four damage dealers on the team and we have access to pretty good healing. But if we can have Vestal swinging the mace as often as possible and Bounty Hunter doing marks for Arbalest, that leaves Hellion with a pretty important job of just keeping the front line stunned and locked down so that they aren't putting damage into the rest of the team and forcing you to heal instead of doing damage with other good damage dealers. If it bleeds might actually be the second best Hellion skill. I think Iron Swan might be the best. And then the stun is pretty good, but you know, it's got its drawbacks. But if it bleeds is so good for her because it gives her access to the entire group of enemies. Because between Wicked Hack, Iron Swan, and If It Bleeds, Hellion can hit anyone, which is really nice. And then she's also not dependent on direct damage by being able to bleed them, which is something this team can't deal with otherwise, unless you use, like, Caltrops. So having damage over time, if you're not going to, like, reduce protection, really helps out. And giving Hellion the ability to hit everything helps her clean up a lot of kills easily. For Hellion, I gave her the Crimson Quartz set, just because it is fun to use. So she gets a lot of damage, potential, she gets access to accuracy and dodge and obviously speed, bleed skill chance, death blow resist, all that's pretty nice for her. But you're not stuck with these. That's why I have the trinket box open. You can give her like a heaven's hairpin and like a dazzling charm and she can just be a stunner and be very accurate against backliners. You can give her support trinkets, you can give her thirsting blade if you bought it. There's so many things that you can give Hellion in this case. And you're really just limited by your creativity at that point. The main drawback of this team is that it needs turn 1 to set up. So it needs Bounty Hunter to put down a mark. It needs Vessel to get her damage buff up. And then hopefully between Arbalest and Hellion, you are able to kill the biggest backline threat that's on the board. Or at least weaken it pretty hard so it dies next turn. Turn 2 is a mitigation turn. Which means we're trying to stun as much stuff on the board as possible to reduce damage coming in while Vestal and Arbalest are cleaning up kills. So that means that Hellion is going to be doing a double stun, and usually you're doing a flashbang, or sometimes if you can get someone to like half health, maybe Bounty Hunter can clean them up. So you do have those situations, which are pretty nice. And then turn three, Arbalest is probably out of backline targets, so we're looking to heal, and Vestal's trying to whittle it down to one enemy. And then on turn four, if we can, we're going to stun again, and then heal just to get as much stall and effectiveness out of this team as we can because finding extra turns to heal is never a bad thing. I know a lot of players don't like a stalling playstyle, but I think there's a difference between stalling for like four turns to like heal indefinitely compared to stunning something and then skipping like one extra turn just to get an extra heal out. So I think if you're looking for those things and then prioritizing the right targets, then this team's going to feel pretty cool. One final note is this team cannot handle being moved, which means it doesn't do well in Torchless because surprise is very common, and also there are certain bosses that mess it up pretty bad. So if you understand that you're going to run into heavy movement and stuff like that, then be prepared or bring something different because this team really struggles once it gets knocked out of position because the only person that can really fix themselves is Hellion with Breakthrough, and Breakthrough is like a mediocre move. This last team I cannot recommend for just regular missions. Its best purpose is to counter specific bosses, and it does it in a fun way. It's not even close to being overpowered. It feels pretty bad as a team, honestly. But I did want to use something that showed off Suppressing Fire. And when I was trying to design a team for that, I came up with, like, the two snipers. You know, that's pretty easy. So it's like, okay, we have two snipers that use Suppressing Fire. All right. And then the frontliners, I kind of struggled to find good ones to fill the team. And then I went, why not just use Shieldbreaker because she can just do a bunch of damage and hit everything for free. So I was like, okay, that's cool. And then it turns out this was a named team. It's called the Supreme Suppressors. But that's if we have two Arbalests, we don't have two. We have a Musketeer, but it's the same thing. Both snipers are going to rock the same loadout. And we're starting with Suppressing Fire, which is the entire goal of this build. And Suppressing Fire is honestly not a good skill. I talked about it earlier. The minus accuracy, minus crit is kind of nice. The minus crit isn't as good as you would think. The reason being that a lot of backline enemies are stress dealers or supports. They are not damage dealers. Unless your name is Swineskyver or like a retreating Swinatar or something like that. That's when the crit is relevant, but otherwise it's eh. 
the minus accuracy is pretty nice, but the main drawback of suppressing fire is that the debuff only lasts two turns. I don't know why it doesn't last three. The fact it lasts two is pretty stupid. I wish that would change. Blind fire could be Bola if you really want to for a frontline cleave, but I don't think you need it. And it's nice to be able to do some okay single target damage and give yourself speed because there are some situations where it's nice to give the sniper speed so that next turn and the turn after they can go first and then have more say in what's happening in the battle. So it does have a use that's uh, proactive, which I do like. Bandage, we've talked about in every single build. It's just a good single target heal. And then we have Flare because this is another thing for support. So we have the ability to reduce stress at times, get people out of stealth, which this team doesn't struggle with stealth enemies, and then we can clear stuns and marks, which do keep us alive, so that's kind of cool. For Trinkets, we are going to rock the Crimson Quartz set because this gives Arbalest the most, like, array, or the widest range of bonuses, and obviously no penalties, which is pretty nice. So having the Childhood Treasure is just a better Medic Screeves, and then you activate the set bonus, and it helps keep Arbalest from taking too much damage or stress. The Bedtime Story was the biggest reason to use the Crimson Quartz set, and I guess the, uh, the Musket Ball for the Musketeer equivalent, but the debuff skill chance is what we need because we don't want to run something as low effectiveness as debuff amulet in a team that is already not good. So having the ability to get all of the cool set bonuses from the uh, Crimson Court set together is nice and I don't think the move chance is good enough to warrant Bola, but it's there if you want to use it. And then being able to consistently stick the suppressing fire is what this team has to do. Because if Suppressing Fire gets resisted, it's a complete waste of time, and it sucks. This is the one time having Musketeer active on the file is actually a bonus, because you can use two Crimson Quartz sets! Whoa! It's crazy! All the same reasons as before. But if you did not want to use... Or, if you don't have Musketeer or both sets, because that, that is pretty hard to do. And I'm not going to pretend that that doesn't take some grinding or some luck. Uh, you can have the rank 4... Arbalest or Musketeer, if you use both, have the Wrathful Hat or Bandana, so that gives you debuff chance. Because we do need debuff chance, that is the most important thing for this character. Then your other trinket can be something that offsets the healing penalty or something supportive like the Ancestor's Map. Now we get to talk about our double Shield Breakers, which are carrying the damage load for us, which Shield Breaker is pretty good at that. So this moveset consists of Pierce, which is just to hit stuff all over the place. It's just a great move in general. Impale because double impale across the entire enemy team for like two turns usually kills most of the team. So that's pretty awesome. We have Captivate in case we get some weird speed situation where the person we want to go first goes second in terms of the shield breakers. So this just makes it so we don't have to fight for positioning. And then we have Serpent Sway just to block stuff and stay alive. For Trinkets, I want the second shield breaker to be slower. But she also needs some accuracy, so I gave her the Signet Ring, which synergizes pretty well with the Cure Bully. So she gets minus speed, a bunch of HP, and then protection on top of it, and accuracy. You cover pretty much everything except Blight Chance, which kinda sucks. But as long as one of them is putting up Blight consistently, it's usually enough damage. For Trinket Choices, I'm gonna suggest the Crimson Quartz set on the front Shield Breaker, just because it has a lot of upsides and no negatives besides the Can't Be Guarded. And this team does struggle for effectiveness, so being able to give it as much help as it can get from its trinket choices is going to get you the most value. So it's pretty hard to find lower level trinkets that enable this, so usually you're looking for higher level stuff instead. As I was saying before, this team does pretty good against a couple bosses in the game, otherwise you're not going to be busting it out. It's really just mediocre, and you could switch it up to have the Arbless do more direct damage, which could help it a little bit. Like, you can make one Arbalest the Suppressing Fire Arbalest, and then the other one is the Shoot and Kill Stuff Arbalest. But I think that Shield Breaker can carry enough of the damage that you don't really need to focus on that, so it's better to just nullify the backline and then spend the last couple turns healing up with the two uh, snipers. It's just something fun to try, and it's fun to counter the couple bosses that this will match up really well against. Alright y'all, that's going to do it for this one. Thanks for watching. Follow the social medias, follow the Twitch, join the Discord, all that stuff. I do plan to stream in the next few weeks because I want to establish my Twitch channel a little bit, especially for Darkest Dungeon 2. 
so I hope you all join me. If you make it to Discord, I will ping you for it, and if you are following on YouTube, I will do that little thing where there's like an announcement video, hey, I'm streaming, so be on the lookout for that stuff. Let me know what you're thinking down below about Arblest, whether there's some cool team ideas I didn't consider, or some trinket choices that are maybe some sleeper picks that are out there. Otherwise, I do feel she's kind of hard to build for, so it is nice to have more input. Next up for guides, I think it's Man at Arms next, and then we have Bounty Hunter after that. So we are slowly going through all of the Mark homies, which is, I guess, cool. I've already started the Man at Arms guide, and I am going to be working on a new player guide as well. I just don't know when that's going to be. So I'm going to shut the hell up and get out of this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.